a great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Katie Bellinze. Uh, completed her medical training here in uh, UBC. She's a clinical instructor at UBC Department of Dermatology. She's got a fellowship in laser and cosmetic dermatology. Uh, published a, a number of peer-reviewed articles and textbook chapters. Uh, she's a frequent speaker, just like many of the other speakers, and I guess all the speakers we've had here are, is an enthusiastic speaker. Uh, and she practices here in uh, Vancouver with uh, Shannon Humphrey at the Humphrey Cosmetic Dermatology, and has a great interest in uh, acne also, just like uh, Shannon does. So, uh, Katie, you have the honor of being the last speaker of the day. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you so much to Derm Update and Galderma for inviting me here today. Uh, and it's nice to do a talk in person, uh, not just virtually for once. So I was actually really excited for this. Um, so I get to speak on a cleave today, which is a new topical retinoid for the treatment of acne, uh, specifically for the face as well as on the trunk. And these are my disclosures. I will be speaking about a Galderma product today. And so acne, I think we all know this, it can uh, really affect those who have it. Over 50% have skipped a social event because of their acne. 42% of young professionals say that it has had a negative impact on their career. Uh, nearly half in their, uh, of people in their 20s with acne have given up dating. They're waiting for their acne to clear before they go on a date. 74% have seen a healthcare professional about their acne, but 94% believe their healthcare provider needs to do more to improve their acne. And, and so it can have a big impact. It's associated with lower self-esteem, anxiety, depression. It can produce negative emotions in terms of embarrassment. And there's a big uh, socioeconomic impact as well. And I'm gonna actually add a, I added a couple slides in the perceptions of others of those with acne scarring, but also acne. It can lead to increased unemployment rates. And acne scars can also further affect quality of life. And I added these in just because I thought this data was really interesting when I was reading it. There was a big multinational survey looking at over 4,600 responders, and they had questions about patients, so men and women with clear skin or digitally superimposed acne scars, no active lesions, and they just said, what's the first thing you notice about this person's face? And when their skin was clear, the first thing that was noticed was their eyes, their mouth. But when they had scarring, the first thing that was noticed was their skin. And I use that parallel even when patients come in and ask about removing a mole or others. And I'm like, listen, our eyes aren't drawn to that mole. They might be drawn to a scar that I leave behind. And so aesthetically, you have to take that balance. And it's the same with acne scarring. And there was another study that looked at the same concept. So patient like clear skin or dig digitally superimposed acne scars. And they just asked a number of respondents, you know, what do you think about this individual? And when the patient or the image had acne scars, they said, you know what? That person's probably less confident. They might be less healthy. They might not be as good at sports or public speaking, and they're probably more stressed. And so acne scars can have a big impact on a person's life, not only their own self-esteem, but others' perceptions of you. And so all that to say, we really want to try and intervene with acne, treat it early, try and prevent the scars as best we can, because as we know, it's very hard to treat acne scarring once it's already there. So I get to talk about a cleaf today, and what's interesting about a cleaf is that it's actually approved for truncal acne. And we don't have a lot of data on effective treatments for truncal acne. But as we know, acne is most commonly on the face, but it's then quite common as well on the trunk. And about 52% of patients with facial acne also have truncal acne. And 78% of patients wanted their truncal acne treated too. And it's one of those things that you, you have to ask about. And I often will say, hey, you know, do you have any acne on your chest and back? Do you mind if I take a look? Um, sometimes the teenage boy patient might be a little reluctant to show me and I'll sort of encourage them to let me see because it does impact my treatment or approach to treatment um, and to let them know they can treat that area as well. And so truncal acne um, can scar and it's important to recognize and treat it and you can have an increased predisposition to get hypertrophic and keloidal scarring on the trunk. There's also a possibility of this perifollicular elastolysis type of scarring and just some images of that. Um, scarring, of course, is more, well, we can see it actually more commonly in males than females on this trunk. Um, and darker skinned phototype patients are more tr 
prone to this hypertrophic and keloidal scarring. And it can be really bothersome from a quality of life perspective. We know it's very hard to treat once they get this more hypertrophic or keloidal scarring, for example. And so acne, there's the four main pathogenic features. Um, altered follicular growth and differentiation. This is, as I explained to the patient, the clogging of the pores of such or such. Uh, proliferation of cutie bacterium acnes, sebum over production and the ductal blockage, and then inflammation. And those features can play a role altogether. Trying to target as many pathogenic features with our treatments can be beneficial. And I actually talk about pathogenesis with patients in my explanations as to why I want them to use their topical as more of a field treatment, right? I'm trying to prevent this progression from the blocked pore, the sort of progression to the papule, the pustule, and so all that takes time. And so you using the topical as a spot treatment is not as effective as putting it all over, trying to prevent acne from coming six, eight, 12 weeks down the road. And sometimes patients start to understand why I'm suggesting that because inevitably they fall back to sort of wanting to spot treat their acne with the topicals. And I also use pathogenesis to explain why it takes time to see improvement with your acne medications. You're not gonna see it right away. We're sort of using this topical treatment to prevent these um, main features. And so give it time, give it a few weeks, several weeks before we start to see improvement. Of course, we talk about the irritation they may experience in the beginning as well, potentially. And so that's a conversation I have with my patients, particularly when I'm prescribing topicals. So topical retinoids, so they're an essential acne management tool. And if you look at the guidelines, Canadian, American, other different guidelines, retinoids are sort of the main um, role. They have a role from mild acne to severe acne as sort of first line therapy. And they work because they're comedolytic. They also resolve that precursor microcomedone lesion and they're anti-inflammatory. So they kind of target various pathogenic features. Um, and really uh, because of that, it's often one that we'll include in our first line treatment. This is my own slide, but I just wanted to include sort of other roles and how we use topical retinoids across dermatology. So it's commonly used in photo aging and fine lines, and there's review papers that have looked at the benefits of retinoids for stimulating dermal fibroblasts, increasing collagen. Um, they can prevent that increase in matrix metalloproteinase synthesis, which can degrade collagen and other things. They can be used for skin texture via that increased collagen effect, but also um, enhanced deposition of hyaluronic acid. There's been evidence around acne scarring and the benefit of retinoids, um, down-regulating MMPs and also improving collagen. And then pigmentation and retinoids and turning over the skin cells, which can help with evening out the skin tone, as well as there's evidence on suppressing melanocytes. So they have a wide range, and that's not to talk about their role in other conditions, psoriasis, precancerous lesions, but in addition to acne, we use retinoids for different roles. So I'm gonna talk specifically about a little bit of basic science because it goes with the mechanism of a cleave. So RAR gamma, so the retinoids sing signal through three different RAR subtypes. And gamma is the most prevalent subtype in the skin. And this can work, so there's lots of different mechanisms as to why RAR gamma and how it works, but infl inflammation is modulated with this AP1 pathway. There's epidermal turnover and normalization of that epidermal turnover, keratinization, desquamation process. And What's exciting about a cleave is we now have this fourth generation retinoid. So we started off with the first generation with tretinoin, and then second generation acetretin, we don't use it for acne. Then we had third generation, to, so tazeratine and adapalene. And with time, we now have a cleave, which is RAR uh, gamma specific. And what, why is that exciting? Well, we can target large surface areas with it. I'll talk a little bit more about basic science. RAR gamma is the most prevalent receptor in the skin, and it's potent and effective at low doses because we're targeting that RAR gamma, which is this very prevalent receptor. There's also low systemic exposure from using it, especially if you're using it on large surface areas, and it's rapidly eliminated from the body. And so I actually went into the basic science because I was like, oh, RAR gamma, it's been a while since I've reviewed all these retinoid receptors. So I looked at the British um, Journal of Dermatology paper evaluating triferritine and comparing it to other retinoids that we had. 
So triferritine, and so these are slides I put together, but triferritine showed dose-dependent comedolytic activity and was able to achieve 98% reduction of um, comedones. This is in a mouse model, by the way, the typical mouse model that they use uh, to evaluate comedolysis. And that was at 0.01%, which was compared with tazerotene, which at that concentration was tenfold higher. If you compared the 0.005%, which is a cleaf uh, triferritine, compared to tretinoin 0.05%, there was about 77% reduction with the triferritine versus 61% reduction with uh, tretinoin when it comes to comedones. Triferritine increased epidermal thickness, which we understand from retinoids, and also had potent anti-inflammatory effects. They used uh, a typical model with uh, like an ear model, uh, inflammation and edema model for that. And it also showed anti-pigment effect, um, and triferritine did along with tretinoin, um, more so than they saw with adapalene, but that was promising in that you could also normalize some pigmentary changes. What about the gene expression? Um, and I know I'm kind of getting into deep science here, but I thought it was good to go back and take a look at it. But the genes were the typical ones involved in retinoid pathways. So epidermal differentiation, proliferation, but there were three new pathways that they identified in terms of gene expression with triferritine. One was cell adhesion, and that was down-regulated, so that may show why it works for its comedolytic activity. The second was transport or skin hydration, and it activated aquaporin. And so the idea was, well, maybe this helps with barrier function a little bit, and there was less transepidermal water loss seen uh, with triferritine compared to the tretinoin and triferritine, or tazerotene or molecules. And then proteolysis, um, matrix metalloendopeptidase was downregulated, and that's been shown to be associated with degradation of elastic fibers. And so the thought in this basic science paper was, hey, maybe there's a positive effect on skin aging from that perspective. Obviously, more evidence needs to be shown, but it was interesting to see some of the gene um, expression studies as well. So in summary for the basic science, that this is that first fourth generation RAR gamma agonist, um, and it, one of the interesting points, minimal RAR beta um, effect, and that was proposed to be in part why it may have some or less skin irritation um, compared to some other molecules. It's rapidly metabolized by these human hepatic microsomes, and the half-life is quite low. And when it was being studied, it was like, hey, maybe we could use this in ichthyoses or other full body things, and so safety using it widespread on a surface area was considered, which as we're using it truncal acne other areas, you're putting it on more, though typically Typically, I'm not worried about systemic side effects with topical retinoids. Um, and then we've already highlighted it's comedolytic, anti-inflammatory, and potentially reducing pigmentation properties, the gene expression pathways. And then the science paper said, you know, this role in reduction, reducing pigment, some of these other pathways, maybe it can be helpful for PIH or scarring, but we need more clinical data on that. So that's a little background on triferritine, which I thought as a dermatologist group would be good, because when we were first reviewing this, it was like, okay, remind me about RAR gamma. How does that work? What's the role? So a cleaf will go into the clinical uh, data that we have. So as mentioned, the first new retinoid in 20 years, so approved for treatment of truncal acne as well as facial acne. And in the pivotal, stu in the pivotal one study, there was over 50% fewer inflammatory lesions on the face and the trunk at week 12. Um, and there's two very large clinical trials which we can highlight today, specifically for moderate truncal and facial acne. And so with these studies, the Pivotal One study had 119 sites, majority were in the US, there was 13 Canadian sites, which is great, and then the Pivotal Two uh, was majority of the sites were in Europe. And the study population was moderate acne, so IgA3, so 20 or more inflammatory lesions and 25 or more non-inflammatory lesions. And it was nine years of age or older at screening and then truncal acne, similar um, grouping with moderate acne and randomized to either the Acleaf cream or the vehicle cream. And the duration was 12 weeks. The primary efficacy was face acne and success going uh, from moderate to a clear or almost clear, so a two grade improvement, um, and absolute changes in facial inflammatory and non-inflammatory lesions. And secondary efficacy was looking at the truncal acne. Safety endpoints were of course examined as well, looking at the tolerability. 
And uh, for many of us, we know the IgA scores going from clear, almost clear, to mild, moderate, and severe. And moderate was what this grouping was with more than half of the surface involved, many comedones, papules, and pustules. One nodule could be present, and they had to go to a clear or almost clear. And PGA was used for the trunk and similar concept in terms of evaluating those patients. And so this, uh, for your reference, is how the trunk was evaluated in the trials. And I put a little image of what the sort of shirt looked like. Um, but the chest was evalu evaluated superior superiorly between the palpable acromion processes and inferiorly at the xiphoid process. And the back, um, you can see at that superior aspect of the posterior axillary fold and above. And this was evaluated as one contiguous area as the trunk. Um, demographics were uh, very similar between the cleave cleaman vehicles, so most uh, sort of 50-50-ish uh, between less than 18 or over, same with female versus male. And uh, Fitzpatrick skin type, there was 75% in one to three, which is typically what we see, but there was a grouping in the Fitzpatrick phototype four to six, and over 2,400 patients. And the acne characteristics, again, quite similar uh, with the number of facial inflammatory, non-inflammatory lesions for the face and the trunk. So nine out of 10 patients completed the Acleve cream treatment over the 12 weeks. Um, there was some discontinuation, uh, but I will go through some of those. Adverse events was about 2% in the one study and 1.5% in the other study. Um, and let's get into some of the results. So IgA success rate, so significantly improved IgA success rate with a cleave versus vehicle cream at week 12. Um, and you can see that uh, starting to be statistically significant at week four in the one study and week eight in the other study. Uh, the mean percent reduction in facial inflammatory lesions, uh, about over 50% mean percent by week eight using a cleave cream. And then similarly with the non-inflammatory lesions, 50% mean percent reduction in the non-inflammatory lesions by week 12 with a cleave cream. So I'm um, seeing good results out to week 12 as these studies typically go. They don't tend to in these original ones go out further than that. PGA success rate um, significantly improved versus vehicle at week 12. And you can start to see it pulling apart at week eight there versus vehicle and then a reduction over 50% in truncal inflammatory lesions by week eight, and that was statistically significant as well. And as well, the non-inflammatory lesions. So they often go hand in hand, you see both, and in this case, you saw that for the truncal lesions as well as the facial lesions. And so looking at the results, this is a patient going from an IgA3 to an IgA1 of almost clear um, at week 12, this patient was actually considered a treatment failure. So at week um, 12, they were in IgA2, so they didn't have that two grade improvement. And this is an example of a trunk patient who went from a PGA3 to one, and so a treatment success on the trunk. Tolerability, I think, is one thing we're all very interested when we get a new retinoid. How will our patients manage with it? Will they be able to use it? Um, and so this is for the um, pivotal studies, but you can see that like other um, retinoids, you see that little peak in the first week or two, and then it settles down um, going out towards week 12. And the cases really were around a mild, so a one or under in terms of the degree of either redness, stinging, uh, burning, dryness scale, uh, those sorts of parameters that were studied. Tolerability on the trunk, it's better tolerated on the trunk, which does make sense based on sort of the thickness of the skin and other experiences. Um, it was a little bit of a slower peak um, and slightly delayed compared to that sort of more quick peak you see with the face. Um, and again, settling down over the course. Uh, my own experience with patients' tolerability on the trunk has been quite really good, in fact, um, even more so than the face. Um, and then so safety profile, uh, less than 2% of patients discontinued due to the adverse events, but irritation and itch were um, the more common of those and you can get that redness as well. And so we do have a long-term study to evaluate um, as well. And this one uh, was, again, moderate acne on the face and the trunk going out to uh, 52 weeks. Uh, which is nice to have the long-term data. And the primary efficacy with this long-term study was more safety, but secondary endpoints around efficacy were evaluated as well. 
And I just included this just briefly, um, not comparative data, but you can see, as we see with many retinoids, that as you continue to use the topical over time, you see continued improvement. And I often say that to patients, don't stop at 12 weeks, you might see further improvement the longer you use it because of some of this information. It takes longer for some of these uh, retinoids and topicals to show full improvement. And the tolerability was the, and the uh, safety was the main goal of this long-term study. And you can see here that peak at uh, week one or two and the slightly less big of a peak, slightly delayed um, with the truncal severity scores in terms of redness irritation, but the side effects were mild. And of the safety, the majority of the uh, treatment-related adverse events were in the first quarter of the study. Um, severe adverse events were um, only in about three subjects thought to be related to the study drug, and that was irritation, um, redness, itch. Um, and about 12% had some skin-related adverse events. Uh, there were some who discontinued, but the majority were uh, subjects requests or loss to follow up. And this is a good example of a patient over the course from baseline to week 12, week 26, week 52 of the improvement. And you can see at week 12, they actually in the original study wouldn't have made that too great improvement um, level. But with time, they continue to get better. And we do see that with our topical retinoid um, patients and those uh, as we get more experience with the cleaf, we should ideally be seeing that as well with long-term use. This is my own slide, just a few other of my own um, experience. I've found, so we've been using it for several months here now, and you know, of course my main prescription as we got it was around mild and moderate facial acne. Um, so patients who come in, present with their facial acne, it's a, a great retinoid option for that. Truncal acne, because it's the one that we have evidence on now, and it sort of has this data that is reassuring and useful for me that it is effective for truncal acne. Uh, Off-label in my own experience, I do find that patients are tolerating it extremely well, and I'm curious to get other thoughts as they've been using it, but it's been useful for some patients who view their skin as more sensitive, sometimes dry, they haven't been able to tolerate um, you know, a fixed-dose combination topical with benzoyl peroxide or other things. I have found that patients have been doing quite well with tolerability with this topical. Um, and some of that basic science stuff around like the, the barrier function and other things, I'm like, oh, maybe it is. Maybe because it's more targeted, it can be more potent. I can get away with seeing the effect, but with slightly less irritation. So that's something that's been nice to see. Um, Off-label, I have, because it's on the trunk, I've been using it for some keratosis pilaris patients in addition to a moisturizer and seen some improvement. A couple patients have come back with that. I do, of course, because I have the aesthetic side as well, do a lot of prescriptions for just general photoaging and skin pigmentation, tone, texture, and I've uh, been finding success in that group as well who might not tolerate as much irritation. They want the cosmetic elegance, the uh, nice feeling. They don't want to be too peely. This is a good option. Post-isotretinoin, I do like to use a topical uh, for maintenance and prevention of recurrence of acne, um, and so that's another consideration. And then mask-induced acne, or maskne as it's commonly called, I sometimes will use a gentler retinoid for. You know, not for the true periorificial or perioral dermatitis patients that we're seeing, but an actual true acne patient who can't tolerate something too irritating. That's another um, role that I've, I've found um, I can use a cleave for. So I think there's a range. We don't have all the data on this. This is off-label. It's on-label for facial and truncal acne. But I think as we get experience, we'll see sort of where it fits in our practices. So just in terms of considerations for use, the idea is to cleanse the skin, um, and then we treat with this, uh, you know, a gentle cleanser, um, use, avoid using skin products that are too irritating. Um, a thin layer should be applied over the face and or trunk, and in the next slide I'll talk about the number of pumps to use. Moisturizer, they say you can use it after, some people prefer before, that's fine too, and even some patients, as we know, like to mix a little bit in together if they're particularly sensitive. Um, so any of the above, just a gentle moisturizer and then sun protection is recommended for using these topicals and just in general in dermatology. Uh, and then, there we go. 
The indication technically, so on label, a cleave is used for treatment of acne of the face and or trunk in patients 12 years or older. You saw some of the data was down to nine, but on label it's 12 years or older. The trade size is a 75 gram pump, um, and one pump shouldn't cover the entire face with a thin layer. Two pumps should cover the upper trunk, which is what you saw in the study. And then you could use an additional pump if you need to do mid or lower back as well. Moisturizer is recommended. Um, and how long does it last? These are questions I put to this slide because patients also ask and this information has been gathered. But if you're using just the face, it typically lasts on average five to six months is the thought with the amount that comes out in each pump. If you're covering the face and trunk, it should last about two to four months. Um, and it currently doesn't have public coverage, but does have uh, quite good extended health private coverage. About 85% or more are covering a cleave right now. Um, and it's priced around, and this varies of course by region and pharmacy, but around 185 plus dispensing fee. There is a patient assistance program uh, through November 30th where patients can get the cost of the 100% of the prescription cost covered, um, but the, the, other than the dispensing fee. But there's also samples available um, and readily available. So if you want one, talk to your uh, local rep to kind of help uh, support that. I don't like carrying paper in my office, so I just have the little patient assistance program cards in an email that I just print when a patient comes in for ease. So adverse events, of course, being a retinoid, we need to consider this. And I think, you know, I talk about the uh, very good tolerability with a cleave, but I think everyone's different, right? Some patients tolerate one thing versus another. It is a cream, um, but dryness, redness, burning, irritation, and peeling are the big things. And making sure that we uh, counsel patients up front that this may be experienced, particularly in the first couple of weeks, um, because this is the biggest reason for treatment failure, lack of compliance. Patients start it, they think they're allergic, they're um, worried about it, and they discontinue. So I actually give all my patients a handout on how to use topical retinoids and strategies for if they get irritated, how to restart. Um, and these are some of the uh, strategies that can be used. So use a small amount of the medication. You can start every other day. In fact, I typically get patients to start every other day just to ease into it. If they're really sensitive every third day, you know, however they need to to tailor it, working their way up to daily as tolerated. Wait 30 minutes after washing the face can help with those who are sensitive. I don't typically counsel that up front just because it may reduce compliance with putting on their medication if they have to wait, but it's on my list of things to do if they find they're irritated. Moisturize, um, you can also do short contact applications, so just apply it for a few hours, rinse it off, and then of course make sure you know what else they're putting on so that they're not using harsh exfoliators and beaded lush brands, so I don't know, different things that you don't want them using in conjunction with your topical. So to summarize, triferritine is this first retinoid molecule of its kind for the treatment of acne. It's the first one actually in 20 years and indicated for the treatment of truncal acne as well as facial acne. Um, the proven efficacy, so we have the different studies where it had over 50% improvement in the inflammatory lesions on the face and trunk at week 12. Really visible results. You can see the um, improvement in the two clinical trials. Um, and I have to say, I'm using it for both. A lot of facial acne, as mentioned, off-label indications, and trunk. Uh, it's great for the trunk, too. It doesn't have the benzyl peroxide component, which can bleach clothes and pillowcases and things. So from that perspective, it, it is easy for patients to use. There is important safety information that you can be read, but we went through uh, most of this in the talk. And I will open it up to questions and comments, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie, and uh, thanks for Galderma for this open session. I'll, I'll maybe start. Mm -hmm. um, I was part of the uh, clinical trial program, and uh, I was impressed with the uh, clinical trial program. But you know, sometimes things that are in the clinical trial program that don't pan out quite the same in real life. Uh, but I think this is a drug that does. <laughs> I, I found it uh, very highly effective, mm -hmm. um, much uh, gentler than some of the other retinoids, but it's still a retinoid. I must admit, I go slow with it. Uh, doing all those and educating my patient because I don't want to phone back. I don't want them to phone two days later. Oh, it's irritating and everything else. Go slow, because uh, uh, thing and then recognize that, you know, that the mo number one treatment or number one disease that we see as dermatologists for most of us is acne. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have a new drug, and I think it's also nice to have the evidence-based um, 
thing that is good for back neck. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed in the clinical trials about the post-inflammatory uh, changes. So uh, one, I use it as the, my go-to post-isotretinoin. Uh, I used to use uh, ad uh, adapalene. Um, and I also, I'm using it more and more, I practice in Toronto. I, many of us practice in big cities. Um, a lot of uh, people of color, uh, so East Indian population, uh, black population, uh, and it's, I, I'm, I think it works and decreases that thing. I can think of somebody that uh, had really a lot of post-inflammatory changes on her back, uh, relatively mild to moderate acne, and I was telling her, well, okay, this is going to take you away your acne, but those uh, kind of dark patches maybe never really completely go. And she came back about three months later and goes, you're wrong, Dr. Lind. Got rid of the acne and got rid of my dark spots. So I don't know anybody else found that uh, post-inflammatory changes. Yeah, John has too. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I, you know, it's funny because I, I actually pulled up the basic science data because I was like, oh, it's working on pigment. Like what, you know, and you also sometimes when things are gen feel or patients are like, oh, I'm not getting irritated by it. You kind of have this, is it working? Like it, but you're seeing the improvement. And then I just felt reassured seeing some of the data like, okay, it, this is effective. It's working. Patients are happy, but it's for many can tolerate it, which I think was a nice thing for me to see too. John? Yeah, um, Dr. Blyden, that was a very good talk. I'm curious to know where you're using it in combination therapy with your acne patients. Like, I sometimes might use one topical on the face, one on the back. Where do you find this leaf as well in with combination therapy? You mean oral combination therapy or... You know, I try and keep it simple with having one topical for face and truncal acne just for ease of compliance. But I, of course, with oral medications, am doing a lot of, like, I prescribe the oral plus give them a topical at the same time. And so all my patients who get started on oral antibiotic get a topical as well. And then they stop the oral antibiotic after a few months, continue on with the topical. Similarly with my patients who are on hormonal types of treatment. Um, and so I find that sort of combination is, is my go-to and they can use the Aclef long term as a like great for your skin on all aspects plus maintain that improvement with your acne. Um, but I do use usually one for both face and trunk, but it depends on the patient. Is that your question? Uh, your comment about, you know, uh, unfortunately you know, we have to for particularly dermatologists or healthcare workers and many of the rest of the people have to wear masks on a long-term basis. I wear a mask from 6.30 in the morning to usually to until 5 or 5.30, mm -hmm. continuously. And I've been finding more and more people having a mask knee or whatever you want to call it. So their skin is irritated. And even if they don't have uh, too much acne, um, and I'm going to kind of go to drugs that I know aren't going to irritate as much. Mm -hmm. I'd rather be uh, treating with something that's not going to irritate them rather than giving them something that irritates them, getting that foam back and having the distrust of the patient uh, on that. So I think this is a uh, drug, but again, as I mentioned, I go slow with it. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh, here, uh, Dr. David Adam uh, says, something to highlight with this med is that it is somewhat a novel mechanism of action for acne and that it tag targets a gamma RAR. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's, as dermatologists, it's exciting to get something new, right? And I think we've all had the patient who's tried, like, multiple different topicals for their acne, and none of them worked, or they didn't, you know, they were too irritated, or that one caused an allergic reaction. So we also are lucky to have a novel <laughs> mechanism of action and something that patients might be encouraged or more motivated to try going in, going slow, like you said, trying to get them to be able to tolerate it, um, that's been a, a place for success in my practice too. Yeah, and then again, just as you pointed out, it's nice to have something else uh, from the point of view of, say, keratosis pilaris, mm -hmm. right? Uh, something else to uh, use there. Uh, and uh, David further goes on to say, um, so there was another retinoid, it's a new type of retinoid, aka not just another retinoid. That's true. Goes to say. Exciting. Any other questions? Innovative. Anyway, th thanks very much, Katie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so and much, thank you, you for uh, Galderma for uh, sponsoring this session.